Hello and welcome to another podcast for National Insect Week 2014. I'm joined today by Professor Jane Memmott, who is the head of the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Bristol. So thank you, um, Jane, for joining us today. You're very welcome. You're possibly best known for your work with pollinators. So what first drew you to work with these insects? Um, well, I've always thought pollination was just really, really interesting and really nifty and just uh, intriguing to watch. But what got me in was um, I worked on um, plant herbivore parasitoid networks for a long time, and I just arrived here in Bristol, and they're, they're fantastically fun to work with, but they're, they're really labour intensive. You have to rear everything out, you've got to collect your herbivores and rear them out and feed them and get the parasitoids out. And I was sitting in the field once watching pollinators visit flowers, and just thought, well, actually, if you're in the field, you can just get that data, you just sit there and you just you don't have to rear anything. There's more time in the field, but it's much quicker um, to get in network level data. So this is where you sit in a field, you just see what yeah. turns up and you document what kind of Yeah, things. it's a bit more it's kind of a bit more complicated now, but not much more. You basically walk along transect lines, so you set up lines across your plot, mm-hmm. you walk along those, you catch your pollinators, because some things you can identify on the hoof, but not that many to be honest, and certainly all the flies and things you can't. So you collect your insect That gets collected along with the record of the plant it's visited. They then go to taxonomists. Then at the end of the season, you've got your plant record that the insect was found on, your Latin binomial for your insect, and you've got the link between them. And you do that several thousand times over, and that data together gives you your your networks. Um, So you have a real good picture of what interacts with what and how often they interact. Yeah, so you know who's visiting who, whether it's a common interaction or a rare interaction, you know the main players in the game. Because although there might be you know, a couple of hundred pollinator species, even in a single field, and and a hundred plus plants, there's normally key players there. So there'll be a couple of dozen plants that are common, um, and again with the pollinators, and then a long tail of rare things. So what kind of results have you been getting at? It's a long, obviously, and a number of studies, but yeah. what kind of results are you seeing well, with we, your research? We use, we use it basically, the pollination network thing is, is used as a tool to ask a whole variety of questions. So um, it can be anything from restoration ecology, how do we fix damaged and degraded habitats? And people have done lots of work on getting the plants back, but unless you get the pollinators back, it's, it's, it's not sustainable. You, it's like gardening, basically. Unless you've got pollinators doing the pollination and leading to seeds that lead to recruitment. Um, it's not long-term sustainable conservation. So the respiration side has been really big. Um, the, the one at the moment that's taking up a lot of time and, and, and kind of thought processes is the urban pollinator project. So asking, where, where do pollinators actually live in the UK? No one systematically surveyed the country to ask, well, where are pollinators in general and how important to urban habitats is what we're particularly asking. And So on this project, we asked, first of all, where are pollinators? So we surveyed 36 one kilometre um, plots. These are big plots. And we had 12 farms... Um, 12 cities and 12 nature reserves um, from Dundee to Southampton to Cardiff so right across the UK and then the last two years we've, been, we've homed in on four key cities so Bristol, Reading, Leeds and Edinburgh but each city is divided up into 10 different regions and in each of those 10 regions we look at the nine different habitats that occur in it and asking well if you've got looking at a whole city as a system as a whole habitat um, where are pollinators in there? Where are the hot spots for pollinators? And so we again systematically went through all of those different habitats in the different cities, in the different region, in the rich parts and the poor parts of the cities, and so on, um, to work out who's living where, basically. And then the final thing was to actually do a big experiment. The really fun thing is when you get to kind of perturb the system, you get to poke it in some ways and predict <laughs> what's going to happen. What if? And the, the 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 manipulation we've done in cities is actually adding a habitat. And what we've done there is the most kind of ambitious thing I've ever uh, ever been involved in, which is we've planted um, flowering meadows in four of the cities. So these are big meadows. Each meadow is 300 square metres, so it's, it's, it's large. If you pace it out, that's a really big area. And we've put in 15 of those in four cities in a block design to ask, well, actually, if you give pollinators more food, do you get more pollinators? And although it might seem obvious that you will do, it's actually not necessarily true because they might not be food limited in cities. It's actually lots and quite a lot of food in cities compared to farms and, and nature reserves. And they could be nest site limited or something. But to, to work out what is important, you need to kind of manipulate something and see if it makes a difference. How can people, or how, how does your research advise um, the, the everyday, the public, or, or conservation managers, maybe? Um. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, what we'll end up, so we're still analysing the data from, from this project. We're in the last kind of um, about six months or so of the project, so everything's kind of coming together. 
We'll come up with lists of plants that pollinators like. So, I mean, there's lots of lists out there at the moment, but they're not scientific, they're not really informed by science. Um, we'll actually know which plants insects are visiting across the four cities. We'll know which, what are the good areas, because actually there are some surprises out there. Um, everyone knows gardens are reasonably important. Um, but when you start looking across cities, some habitats, things like allotments turn out to be surprisingly important. You know, habitats where people wouldn't even think of looking, because, you know, allotments are a man-made habitat, they're about producing food, they're not, there's nothing... But they're fantastic for weeds, and lots of, of the um, vegetables, when they bolt, onions are one of the best flowers out there for pollinators. It's about advising people on the areas they need to conserve above and beyond the obvious ones for pollinators, and, and having a more joined-up um, sort of approach. So the road verge people need to talk to the park people, they need to talk to the allotment people, because as far as the pollinators are concerned, these aren't completely separate habitats run by separate sections of, of, of the council or whatever, they're all one habitat. And by people um, perhaps talking together more, knowing of the value of these other habitats at perhaps different times of the year, then um, we can actually have a, a, a more coherent strategy for, for pollinators in the city. And also simply by knowing what's there. We found really rare pollinators in cities. You know, the, there's all the lists of, 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 of um, rare species and so on. But, you, you know, in, in Cardiff, for example, there was a rare bee and it was in, it was in the nature reserve in, in, um, outside of Cardiff, the farm outside of Cardiff. And right in the middle of Cardiff was this bee. Um, and if you don't know they're there, you can't do anything about protecting them. So knowing about whether you've got good populations of the, you know, the, the normal, the usual suspects that, that you would expect to find around, plus what else is there, um, has been really ra- rather fun. And we're providing all of the landowners with species lists and things like that. You know, cities are a, a, an anthropogenic habitat. They're, 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 they're primary purposes for, for people to live in. But if we can actually have them good for pollinators and good for people, that's a, a win-win situation. And it may be the sorts of models that we're putting together will be able to actually inform, in, in terms of mitigation when you're losing an area, how much you need to replant in order to kind of make, make it good for pollinators. Um, one of the yeah, really exciting areas are, you know, cities are surprisingly good for pollinators, um, by and large. Um, can we make them better? And if by planting slightly different plants in urban planting schemes, that, you know, might be no skin off the nose of the, of the, of the people that are planting, it doesn't cost any more, but it's, it's five times better for the pollinators. That sort of information can be used when actually doing urban planting schemes. So what kind of plants are beneficial for these bees? If you could design your, your perfect um, garden, perhaps. Perfect garden. You want to look for things like... You, you want things flowering all year round. So it's no good if the garden looks drop dead gorgeous in August, but actually there's nothing flowering for several other months of the year. You've got to go for that continuity. You don't want lots and lots of food just in the summer because the first queen bees come out in February, March, um, and they need food. And the last big queen bees, sticking with bees, will go in October sort of time. So you want you need a regular supply throughout the year. And in some ways what, what people need to look at perhaps a bit more is actually, it's not the amount of nectar, it's the distribution of that nectar through time. Because if there's bucket loads in June, July and August, that's kind of fine, but that's pretty hopeless for anything around before then. Basically, garden plants get divided into three main classes. You've got your early spring one, your very early spring ones, you've got the mid-spring ones, the summer ones, and the autumn ones. Make sure you've got plants in all of those classes, and make sure you've got spare parts, because if you end up with a wet spring that certain plants don't like, you've got other ones that will kick in, so you've got a fair few spare parts in the system. Be a little bit kind to your weeds. We, we're starting to develop the saying, yeah, be kind to dandelions. Dandelions are amazing. If they were rare, gardeners would fight over them, I swear. They are really attractive flowers, but because they're weeds, people just mow them and pull them out and things. <laughs> But early in the spring, if you want to find a solitary bee, one of the best places you can look is go, find, go look at some dandelions. There'll be solitary bees on there. So, you know, mow around them. Don't, don't go over them. Just go around the edges of them. So um, dandelions are beneficial dan- to bees. Keep the, Bees love dandelions, yeah. And several other bunches of pollinators too. But dandelions, are, they're dead easy to grow. They grow like weeds. Um, so it just, just be nice to dandelions. What are the main groups of pollinators that we can see in our garden? Well, your main groups are going to be the bees that everyone knows about. But what they often don't realise with bees is you've got the honeybee, which pretty much everyone in, in the country will have heard of. But there's, I think there's 19 different species of bumblebee out there, of which about half a dozen will be common in cities. You've also got the solitary bees. Now, these are the things that look like either small or very small um, honeybees. But there's, I think there's 270 odd species of these things. And people just don't even realise there's any species, let alone the fact that there's you know, 270 of these things. Mm. So those, those are the bees, those three main groups. Um, you've then got the hoverflies, um, little stripy black and yellow uh, fly-like things. But then there's a whole suite of other flies. Um, some of them are specialist pollinators, like the bee flies, the bombylidae, are just one of my absolute favourite groups of insects. Um, and a whole bunch of, of what I, I sometimes classify kind of tongue in cheek as, as the grotty little dipterans because no one likes, people don't like identifying flies. They're incredibly specious, they're difficult to identify. 
Um, but about two thirds of insects in many habitats are this kind of grotty little diptera category. Everything from like kind of muskids, housefly type things. Um, you've got the beetles. Um, so there's some flower feeding beetles, you've got soldier beetles. Um, so there's a bunch of beetles and all the pollen beetles, which are, you know, there's, there's zillions of them. There's a handful of species. They, they can be incredibly numerous though. Um, and then your fourth group would be the butterflies, which, which are becoming uh, butterflies and moths. So there's day flying moths, night flying moths. Um, yeah. Are you seeing that the composition, the, 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 the species identities, differ between your, your, um, your nature reserves and your farmland and your, your urban city? Uh, yeah, we're finding, I mean, there's, there's I think we're trying to look around it now, but there's, there's more flies in, um, on the nature reserves, I think there's more bees in the cities, and, and so on. So bumblebees seem to do remarkably well in cities, actually. So some groups of insects, you know, if there's, if there's um, plants around to feed on, and there's obviously nesting sites around for those species, then um, they, they seem just fine. It varies according to the different groups. So the different groups, as you might imagine, a bee is a very different... Um, critter to you know, um, you know, a, a little dung fly or something. So they have different biologies, um, different ecologies, um, and they're affected in different ways by the changes in the landscape. Has there been any results that you've seen come out where it has been directly implemented into a city's planning or um, into a recovery effort? So all the way through the project, we've actually had um, this practitioners involved. So practitioners are people that do conservation. So as academics, we sit and we catch things and we do statistics and we write papers. But practically, we're, we're not out there managing nature reserves and doing all, a whole suite of really important things. So in each of the cities we're based in, which is Bristol, Reading, Leeds and Edinburgh, there's, a t- there's practitioners involved with the project locally. And then we all get together once or twice a year to talk about things. Um, and the conference then is, is the chance to actually present to the um, audience. Um, and the feedback we've got so far are things like you know fact sheets and what are the things that work in the different urban habitats. So a to-do guide for you know a, a manager of a cemetery, um, a, a road verges and, and parks and things. What can they do that will make a difference um, to pollinators? Those sorts of outputs which we can then put on the website, people can download them. And those are practically based things that people will be able to do. And the same for garden owners. You know, there's all sorts of things that gardeners can do. And one of the really neat things about urban pollinator projects is that everybody can become a, you know, a conservationist. Everybody, if everyone does something, that will all add up across, across, across the whole country eventually. So it's something where people can get really directly involved. Over the summer, maybe next, prepare for next spring, yeah. what can we do to really help pollinators in our gardens or local spaces? Are there yeah. volunteering opportunities or...? Yeah, there, there's a couple of things. In your own garden, just check for gaps. Okay, check you've got not too many gaps. Um, and, you know, we'll work together with your neighbours. It's fine you having a gap in, in May if next door has got fantastic show of something. You know, pollinators don't work at the scale of individual gardens unless you've got exceptionally huge gardens, <laughs> which most of us haven't. So um, have a look at what you're doing at a street level. Um, the sunny in the, the big meadows we've put in have gone in, in, in parks in the city most. They've gone on some road verges, some council land, uh, and in parks and so on. And if you belong, if you've got a local park, join the friends group and get a wildflower meadow put in. You know that they they can look absolutely fantastic. The meadows we work with were chosen to be not just attractive to pollinators, but people love them too. It's amazing watching the effect. Just walking by them puts a spring in people's step. Back to the council, do, do things like that. The council in Bristol are fantastic. I mean, they they they're the ones that kind of they started these flowering meadows before we came on board. They got a couple in as a practice run. We went to see them, and it was a mix that wasn't chosen as a pollinator mix. It was chosen because they looked gorgeous. But it was one of the best habitats I've ever been in to pollinate. It's entirely by chance. They just got something that was just alive with, with, with creatures. And so we stuck with that mix because we wanted something that was going to look good. Because you don't want something that looks weedy and messy. Not in a city. There's places for those sorts of things. But if it's going to be in a public place, if it looks good, people are much more likely to bond with it. Um, just let me... I mean, there's a letter here that um, just stuck in my filing cabinet, actually, in my, my insect collection. Um, it's a, this is just a member of the public that's written in. And what this is about the effect of their local meadow on them. And what it says is, hello, no query, just a quick email to say thank you to you and your colleagues. I work in Castleby Buildings. One of the high points of my days this summer has been walking past your flower meadows in Castle Park, smelling and seeing all those blooms and all the happy insects bumbling back and forth between them. I really can't adequately express how much joy it's given me, or even why. Some of my colleagues and presumably many, many other people, and presumably it's helped your research and insect populations too. I very much hope you can do it again next year, although you may wish to add some nettles or something thorny to prevent drunken festival goers tearing up the flowers next time. That was distressing. Thank you so very much. So, so this is someone, this was a lovely email to get, completely out of the blue. Um, and you know, that's someone that probably isn't a, is almost certainly not an entomologist, but you know, just walking past that meadow and seeing it grow on a day to day basis makes people happy as well as pollinators. And if it livens up people's walk to work as well as makes bee happy, 
then to me that, that's, that's an absolute classic win-win situation. So I think that has been an unexpected bonus on this project. But if you were going to encourage the next generation of entomologists, what, what would you say is the, the most convincing point or reason to work with them? Uh, oh, because it's fun. Um, it's probably the. Um, it really is fun. I mean, it's a never-ending source of interest and intrigue, and um, and you're never going to run out of insects. You know, it's always going to be even in the most you know middle of some sterile airport somewhere in the world, there'll be an insect to look at. Um, so I do it because it, it does. I just find it enormously entertaining. Um, there's tremendous diversity of things out there, and lots of it you can do yourself. So it's not about. If you're interested in tigers, you're never going to keep a tiger. You're probably never going to see a tiger. If you're interested in insects, there's just so much you can actually do in you know in your own in, in your own home. You, you can keep lots of different types of insects. Well, as a kid, I kept ant colonies and mantids and giant stick insects and a whole range of poor hapless creatures from the surrounding countryside. That I and you know and to this day I'm still rearing caterpillars. I, you know I was rearing caterpillars when I was four and I'm, and you know you, there's all the different habitats. You know ponds are completely different to fields. I still to this day I love, I've never worked on aquatic systems, but I love going pond dipping. To find your first water scorpion, that is just like really special. Those are really seriously weird insects. And, and you know, you see pictures of them in books, and when you actually see one, um, and even better when I went to the tropics, finding a thing called a bellastomatid bug, which is a, these things are huge, about three inches long. They're, they're flattened things, big predatory bugs with piercing mouth parts and big kind of raptoral front legs. And the female glues the eggs to the male's back. So it's a bit like having your hands glued to the pram, basically. So the male looks after the, the young. And when I found my first bellasporatid bug, and it was a male with eggs on, so I caught it. Then it fell in the swamp, but I got this, this thing and kept it in an aquarium and, watched it, you know, and got the young to hatch out and things. But, you know, you, you, the bellasporatid bugs are great, but I got every bit as much pleasure from that, that first water scorpion uh, uh, as a teenager um, as, as I did from a really, you know, a big tropical so and they're just so interesting they just do so many different things in so many different ways so yeah well thank you Jane I think we're all convinced how we can help pollinators and why they're so important so thank you very much for joining us not at all you're very welcome